Okay, thanks, Patrick. Um, I guess that's also the right spirit because um, the talk kind of has two topics slightly. One is about the pants build tool, and the other one is about um, when would I actually consider using a build tool. Because for me, when I hear the word build tool, I think about Java and 2000, kind of like if you think about programmers that try to fix the year to 2000 glitch and um, sit in the cubicles and have eight bosses and have this massive code base they need to work with and um, they need a build tool to get it all done because otherwise they can't compile the code and stuff like that. That's kind of what, what I feel when I hear the word build tool. But we are here at a Python conference and um, if I think about Python, I don't think about that. I think about, I don't know, programming in the beer garden, um, less, more relaxed, maybe without pants because people don't care, um, as long as you get the job done. That's kind of like more how I think about Python. And that's, there's kind of like a difference to it. And um, goal of this talk today is that, that I can or try to explain you that we have build tools that I would normally consider in the Java world, for instance, but they're also totally useful in the Python world. And um, I'll try to explain that to you. And um, before we dive into the content, uh, quickly a few words about myself. Um, I'm Stefan, I'm a software engineer working at Blionda. Um, so one of the guys uh, that tried to sell bananas. Um, yeah, you can find my Twitter handle. I will also use that to um, tweet the slides and some examples. And um, yeah, just come to me afterwards if you have any questions. And um, we now try to dive into the content. And we will actually look at two tools today. As Patrick mentioned, one is PEX and the other one is Pants. And um, they both have kind of like um, different use cases but are kind of related to each other. And um, I'm, I'm a user of both of them because I'm Aurora committer and Aurora is using both of these tools. Um, Aurora as well as Pex and Pans have been developed at Twitter and so they are used daily by thousands of engineers. Um, but they are not that known in the Python community and that's kind of what I'm here for today so that you know about the tools and kind of like can consider if you want to use them or not. Um, we'll start with PEX, and if you go to the website and look up what PEX, it's the name stands for um, Python Executables. There's a pep about it, at least on the fundamentals, what it does and um, how it works. And you can think of them like a virtual env, but all in a single file. So like hermetically sealed single file that you run, it bootstraps itself, and then it runs your Python code. Um, that sounds pretty, I don't know, but um, I'll try to give you an example so that you have a feeling for how it works, because I think that's much better than putting something on the slides. Um, so I prepared a super simple demo. There's a folder called my package. In that folder we have a Dunder main. We can look at that one and we see it just contains print hello world. And um, as many of you might know, if you have a folder with Dunder main, you can just run that folder and you see hello whatever you printed in there. But Python has an interesting feature and that is um, it doesn't only do that once you have it in a folder but you can also um, squeeze it in a zip file. So what it can do, I can do app.zip put in my um, main and if I now run that it will also print hello world. And you can go even further if you do something like um, Oops, use it in Python. So we want the uh, shebang, tells us what to execute, my binary, and we pipe that to a file, so that begins with that. And then we go ahead and take our existing app that we sipped, and we append that there as well. And then we make all that thing executable. And then we run it, and it also prints the stuff. So that's pretty interesting. The Python has built-in support for running stuff in zip files. And if we had a header to it, we can just execute it. And um, no need for any bash script all around that, just works like that. And um, the whole idea of PEX is built around that. So we have a zip file, put code in it, and can just execute it, and it works. And um, to kind of prove the point, I've brought a PEX file with me. It's called mathfun.pex, and it's kind of like, um, I can execute it. It just uses NumPy to compute a random number. Pretty boring, but we can look into it. So we can ex um, unzip it, and you see it contains lots of stuff, including NumPy. Um, we also can see the content. So again, we have the main 
Um, can you see that in the back? Yeah, all right. Um, so we have the main file. That's the one that gets executed by Python once we call it um, from the outside. And um, yeah, the rest is a little bit of bootstrapping because sometimes we need special cases or at least pans handle it, PEX handle them for, that, for us. But more interesting, there's also a dependency folder and it contains our dependencies. And as I mentioned, we needed NumPy for that. And if again, look in here, we see, okay, this library, this binary is using click as a command line parsing and it's using NumPy. But interestingly enough, there are two versions in there. There's NumPy 1.15 for C Python, um, but compiled for macOS, and one is the many Linux wheel. So essentially, we have the Linux and the Mac NumPy in the same zip file, in the same PEX file. And that means I can build this, run it locally on my Mac, but also copy it to any Linux server and run it there as well. No need for Docker or anything. I just can wrap it all in a zip file, run it here, run it on your laptop, whatever. And um, that's the whole idea about... Um, about PEX. And um, if you're kind of interested in that, you might think, okay, and I'll go ahead, install me the PEX binary to build my own binaries. And um, you could look at the command line and think about, okay, how do I use it? How do I put in my requirements? Kind of like, how do I build my own <coughs> zip file that I use for deploying or running my code? We um, that one just works with 3.5, but in general, you can use multiple Python words. We come to that in the, in the end. Um, yeah, I'll run out of time if I answer questions now, but um, we can come to that afterwards. So, um, but yeah, just to um, illustrate the point, what you ask is, does it really, does the binary I've just shown, does it work for just for Python 3 or other versions? In this case, it worked just for Python 3. I had to, would have to build a new one for Python 2, and I have, I have an example in the end. Um, but before you, you now go all ahead and remodel your CI pipelines to write some bash to actually build PEX files, um, I, will, I would like to introduce you to PANS, because PANS is a build system. It's just like the thing I would normally imagine you would have a huge Java, Java shop. Um, but it also helps to build PEX files, because it's especially good at if you have different code, or have code that works in different PEX files, so that you can just write it once and include it in different, um, different binaries. And... Um, Again, if you go to the website, you can look up what Pan's doing for you, and it's a build system for Python, Java, Scala, Go, C++. Um, it also has a port for a library such as Thrift or Protocol Buffers that so can generate your files from your specifications. And it essentially supports all the stuff you would imagine that a build tool has. So it can bootstrap itself, it can generate code, it can do dependency resolution, for example, for Python dependencies. It can also do compilation. We don't need that really for Python because um, that's more something you would need in just, uh, Java or Scala. It can run your tests, do some linting, so that all, everything's formatted as it should. And finally, you can do the bundling, which in our case means um, mostly build a PEX file with it. And um, the thing is, if you look at why PANS was built, it was actually kind of like designed so that it, Twitter can use its large monorepo. So they have one massive Git where everything is in it, all servers, servers, all clients, whatever. Um, you can use it for that, but you don't have to. And that's kind of like the, my message here. Um, you can hate the idea of monorepo or you can love it. I don't really care. Um, what I care about is that the tool supports it, but we can also use the tool for other use cases. Um, we can come to that in a second, but the thing you can, can remember is um, when you have a monorepo, your tool needs to support slicing. So you have this massive code base, but you're now just working on this one tiny component and you want the ability to just run the test for this component and maybe other stuff that depends on it, but you don't want to compile everything all the time um, because you want to stay productive even if though there are, I don't know, hundreds of engineers doing changes simultaneously in other areas. And um, that's what Pants is good at, but it's also suitable for our Python stuff. And um, so first of all, as I mentioned, it allows us to build PEX files. So with our own code, but all the dependencies in it, um, it also allows that to kind of use the tool we normally use. So for example, um, at least we often use PyTest to execute our tests. I think it's uh, similar for many of you and kind of like Pants would use PyTest to run Python tests. It also has iSort support, so you can kind of sort your imports and check that it's all okay. It has support for SetUpPy, which is commonly used to build source distributions. Um, that's kind of in there by default. 
Um, and I think one of the most important points is that it's a low um, barrier of entry, meaning if you now consider it will build for a company with a monorepo, um, that normally sounds like you know need a build farm to use the tool and set up servers and all that, but in Pants is pretty simple because it's just a buy, it's just a client, so um, just a local application that you kind of install, then you can use it directly. You don't need to set up anything. Um, you can set up like cache servers so that you don't have to compute all the stuff all over again, but it works um, fine, totally uh, locally, totally fine. Just install it and use it. Um, that's when, when what we're going, going to do now. And another good thing, it's pretty extensible, so it's written in Python. And um, if you have a use case that's not yet supported, you can just write a little Python code and can then extend pants. And um, as it was a monorepo, you can even have your extensions in your own code repository. Um, that makes it pretty flexible. Okay. Um, for all that, it's like a lot of talking, but um, I think it's best if we have a look and just see how pants works. Um, I've built an extensive example. You can, I don't know, um, have a look at this URL. It's mostly all in there. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter and I will tweet it afterwards. That works as well. Um, and I think it really makes, if you want to have a feeling for pans, it makes sense to play around with it a little bit. And, um, yeah. Okay. So how does the example work? Because I need to explain it a little bit. Otherwise it might get confusing for you. So, um, Actually, it's again a simple application that just prints Hello World. Um, this, this is done, so we have this organized source, Python, then we have Hello World, our folder with our packages in it. We have a CLI application with a main.py, and it just does printing one method, printing one string, print Hello World. And um, the formatting for the message is done in an uh, additional module, that additional module is called greeting.py, so just another library that we use in our CLI. Um, and finally, we have tests that test the formatting is all okay. And um, this is kind of like our minimal minimal Python example. Um, but we need a little bit of support for pants so that it knows that we have Python code and uh, what, what it actually means. So what comes on top are build files. And we'll have a look at one of these in a few seconds. So actually, um, normally you put one of these build files in each of your... Um, are you, you have flexibility where you put them, but normally you put in one build file in each Python module. Um, so kind of more one per folder because it's kind of like pretty fine granular description of your thing, but you could also just have one giant one at the top level. Um, you have flexibility, but the recommendation is you have one of these in many, your, most of your folders. In this case, it's pretty extreme because we just have a simple, simple um, main.py and nothing else, but normally you have larger modules as you know. Um, okay. But what what's actually in the build file. And um, here's a simple example. So what you see here is that it's a Python library. So um, the build file will just contain this statement here. It says, what I have in my local folder is a Python library. And you give it a, number, a, a name, and you have a glob to so say, please include all Python files that you find in the folder included in here. So that belongs to this library. Um, and last but not least, you have a list of dependencies. Um, for example, one dependency would be I depend on click for my command line parsing. Or you could say I depend on other libraries in the same repository. For instance, hello world foo, hello world bar, and I depend on that to build my CLI, for instance. And um, this is it's like it's used as a specification kind of, but it's Python code, yeah. Um, if you want, you could do magic stuff in there, like, I don't know, uh, do anything else like contact the server and give me the name that, that, that I need there, but people will come and slap, slap you, I guess. Um, yeah. It's kind of like one of the design decisions that, um, you normally write the specification, but in a large repository, sometimes you need special handling, corner cases, whatever. So, um, they give you the ability to do what you need to get, um, your, your job done until it's finally integrated in the tool. Okay, so um, this specification is used to build the dependency graph. So, for example, my target would be one dot in this graph, and the dependencies would be other dots in the graph. And it's kind of all connected through the dependencies declared here. And um, then we can go ahead and use the command line to do certain things. For instance, we could say pants test um, and give our um, my target library, and they will go ahead. Um, First list, okay, what do I need to do to run tests? I might need to compile, then execute the tests. And then it looks at all the dependencies and figures out which one do I have to compile and which one do I have to test 
to get the whole thing done. Um, that's kind of like um, the general idea, and uh, we will now jump into the console and um, yeah, have a look at it. Okay. First thing is you can ask pants for what it can do for you. So kind of the general goal that you can use pants to to achieve what you want. Um, the list is pretty long, and it even can be extended with plugins, so we don't look at all of them. We'll just look at a few of them. And the first one I want to show you is that you can ask pants to list everything that's in your repository. So pants list, and it will just print all the kind of like all the dots in the graph we have seen. Um, you see a bit, bit more than a kind of like plain would be in the demo, but um, yeah, it's a little more advanced, but we look just at the subset. So the first block is kind of like external dependencies that we have, um, third party requirements like NumPy. Um, we will kind of ignore them for now. Then we have the Hello World. This is our application um, I talked to you about. Then we have additional library MathFun. Um, it's in the repository with some additional information, but we'll just look at Hello World for now. And finally, we have the tests on here. And um, we can now use this information to tell Pant to do something for us. For example, we can tent, Pant please test, and we say, please run all Python tests. So we look at the test folder and say, please run everything that's on, stored on the test Python. And essentially, Pant does the thing. So it's if you look at all the different steps, it will do the setup. It will do maybe code generation. It's not used here, so it does anything. Um, does preparation for the interpreter. Finally, run the tests, and we see here it runs the test for a math library and tests for the hello world example. And that's kind of like how you would interact underneath it using PyTest. Um, yeah. But um, kind of when we started, we that's how you do run tests. But when we started, we started with a binary, so the um, kind of like thing we had in our PEX file went to execute. This one is here as well, so we can ask pants to run something for us. So we get pants, we have a source folder, we have Python, Hello World, and in there we have the CLI, and there's a binary called Hello World. And uh, we can run that. And now again, pants will do it bootstrapping, and we'll run the entry point, the command line we have. You don't see it here because it's kind of hidden in the output. Um, we could either hide the output or I prepared something else. Um, to make it more readable, so we have something more advanced to put, spit it out, so you see it actually runs the command line. Um, if you would be interested to see um, kind of like what dependencies we have in there, because as you remember, we had the build file, and the build file we said what dependencies does our binary have. And um, it's not like in virtual end where you have everything in one large virtual end, every dependency installed, but in Python, in, in pants, you just have the ones you've declared in your local build file plus, plus the dependencies. So we could say, please drop me into, oh, that didn't work. Oh, no, it did work. We can just drop into Python interpreter, and now we just have the um, dependencies installed that we had locally defined. So we could do the same thing here. Um, and we could also say, yeah, please um, go ahead and write the whole setup into um, build a binary. So when I go ahead, look at the build file, and it has actually created, we see here, in the dist hello folder, it has created our hello world pixel. And we can do the same thing as before. We can say hello PyCon, and we can uh, again use the mode, and I don't know, whatever's in there, and use the binary and print it. Um, so that's kind of like, the thing you normally do if you run stuff and um, build your binaries and all that, but there's a little bit more to it um, because pans knows about dependencies, so it can do more important stuff, which is figuring out what's changed. So we go ahead, go to our message, and maybe do some little thing and change it. Now we have um, we've essentially changed code. You can see that in GIF in, in Git. It has changed something. And I now need to look at my cheat sheet because I can't remember it. And what I'm now doing with this command is I'm telling pants, please look at the head of the repository, so kind of git master, and compare what has changed. And it can tell me that this particular 
target. So this particular point in the graph has changed. So it knows, okay, I've changed one build file. It belongs to this point in the graph. But it also knows what what stuff does depend on it. So it can also go ahead and say, okay, I know that dot has changed, but what else has changed as well? So you can look, okay, there are direct dependencies that depend on this. And um, you can even use this then to run your tests. And um, so you no longer have to think about which t I've changed the line, which test do I have to run? But your build tool does it for you. So it figures it out and can even do stuff like, I'm now in the branch and there's master. Um, I could run all tests, but it's enough if I just run the test that would actually affect something. So because um, if it's totally unrelated code, why should I run the test if it hasn't, hasn't anything to do with the code I changed? And um, this is something Pants is offering. So um, jumping back to the slides, um, you can get pretty advanced in those build files. Um, here just a few short examples. So on the on the left, you see uh, everything related to Python. Um, we'll just have a look at two of them uh, because the other one, other step would would be kind of like take too long now. But um, the first important thing is the have the setup pie. So this is the um, the part below, and this allows us to integrate with the existing ecosystem in Python. So we can say, please generate a source distribution for me. So you, our library is not just living in the repository, but we can say, yeah, please also export it so that it. Um, lifts, kind of like create my tarball that I can upload to PyP. Um, this supported there. And there's one interesting thing here, the zip safe. Who has seen that before in SetUpPy? And do you now, now know what it means? Because it now means that you, if this is thing is safe to run a zip file. And um, if you set it to true, it works. If you set it to false, um, the tools like PEX have to do some, some kind of like um, thing, bootstrapping and dump it to disk and it's only then it works. And um, we can also define binaries. Um, this is how it looked like, though pretty similar. You have the name at the top, so you define the entry point, so where we want to run. Um, you can also define the dependencies, and interesting enough, you can define the platforms. You say um, you can run locally, you could also build for Mac OS or Linux, and you can also... That's a good question. Um, I haven't tried it. Um, it get, I think the first thing it depends on is if you have the binaries of num uh, the, the libraries available on PyP, like, um, yeah, we'll have to try it. Um, yeah. And that's kind of it. The, the main gist that's all in the repository if you want to play around with it. And, um, I would now like to kind of move to the summary of it. So, um, what, first of all, what is PAX again? It's a single file hermetically sealed, like your virtual end, like a virtual end, but in a zip file. It helps you to unify local development and deployment because everything we have seen in pants is underneath wrapped in packs. So if we open an interpreter or if we run tests, that's all happening in the packs file as well. And we can also use that for deployment because suddenly we have one file that we can copy to our service. And in some use cases, it allows you even to replace Docker with um, VGET because why do I need Docker if I already have an interpretive machine? I can do just do a VGET download the file and run it. Um, in certain cases, this um, simplifies your setup. Of course, you need the interpreter on the machine because that's not contained in the PEX file, but still it simplifies quite a few things and makes kind of Python behave more like Java where you have the virtual machine and just download your Java file and run it. Um, that's a good thing. And for PANS, it's like a build system. has adds quite a few features as so for Python and PEX. And the important question is kind of when would I recommend to use it? I think most of you won't have a mono repo, and that's totally fine. Um, but there are the use cases when you can still use it. For example, if you have like a la large monolith that you want to split up, split up, and say, okay, I want to pull three services out, um, that's actually a good use case where you can say, okay, I start with pants, I keep it in one repository for now, but I can define the different components in my graph, and um, I will kind of like define this as, I don't know, Microservice 1, Microservice 2, and um, you can slowly iterate and kind of like ensure they're decoupled, um, get the code reused, and then only once you're done, you can say, okay, now I move the whole thing out of the repository. Because if you do it quite in the beginning, you will have lots of complexity with test execution um, because you will find lots of places where you have cross imports and it doesn't really work. And um, the approach with PAN would be something that would probably help you to get there. And finally, uh, sometimes you have the use case that you don't just have the server, but also um, clients. 
and um, sometimes it makes sense to have it in a separate repository, but sometimes also have if it's all in one, because you can just have one repository to care about, one Jenkins job that runs all your tests. And this is kind of where I'm well, was also coming from with Aurora, because Aurora has two clients and um, two binaries that they, you need on each server, and this is all maintained in one repository, which makes it pretty easy because you can suddenly make changes uh, all over the place without having to first update a library, then up bump that both use you know, all users use the library. Um, this becomes significantly simpler. Okay, so coming to an end, um, I hopefully managed to explain you that a build tool is not something for the mega corporations. Um, just something specific, specifically for them, but also we as Python programmers uh, can profit from it and maybe make our lives a little bit simpler. Um, yeah, so thanks everyone for your attention. Um, if you have any question, just come to me. I will be at the booth outside afterwards. Thank you. Question? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for your talk. That was really interesting. Um, I wonder how, how PEX actually works internally. So you say it packages, uh, so it contains wheels. Uh, so does it build a virtual env when you first started? Or? It's a re I can show you. Essentially it is, all those are unpacked. Wow. So, uh, we, there, there were this, um, PEX file we un unzipped. And it has this depths folder, and um, oh. and this is not just the wheel, but it's actually a folder, and you can kind of navigate into it. So what's actually doing is set, just setting the Python path that points to it, and then the interpreter knows find the modules and what's with it. Um, okay, so what about uh, binary modules? How does that work? I mean, I know that there's no portable way to uh, import uh, extension modules like in Windows, Linux, whatever, uh, directly from a zip file. So that actually, that's a good question. I don't know all the details, but um, we could either ask in the Slack channel; they are pretty responsive. Or we could another thing. I mean, uh, we could probably poke around in that Bootstrap folder because I think they're doing some editing in there. Um, Any other questions? Okay, then thanks for the great talk.